Welcome to the Don't Call It Small Business Podcast, powered by Foreman and Associates, LLC, a consulting and professional development services firm. I'm your host, Natasha Foreman. Our podcast provides professionals and organizational leaders with helpful advice, tips, and business news that you can use for training, development, strategic realignment, and more. We examine the tough questions and issues impacting our businesses, households, and communities. If you like what you hear and find the content useful, please share us with your inner circle. Now that we've covered that and you've learned a little about us and why we do what we do, let's get to work. Join us for today's episode. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me. It's your girl, Natasha Foreman. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, If you're new to this podcast or if you haven't listened to episodes 88 and 89, I strongly recommend that you uh, stop listening now and go back (laughs) and listen to those because this is a part three of a multi-part series, folks. We are talking about how to start a business and that also means how to be able to, you know, reignite, reimagine your business. And so... With this being part three, you can already tell that you're you're behind. You're behind. You need to catch up. Yeah, you do. So stop listening to me um, unless you just want to hear my voice. <laughs> but um, if you are ready, right, if you are ready to start a business or your business needs a major pick me up and you have already um, finished or you've started and you just need to wrap up the, the final ends of your homework from um, parts one and two and you're ready to, to dive in for part three then uh, we're good to go if you remember in part one which was episode 88 we discussed some common reasons and beliefs that people stay or not stay <laughs> yeah that's another <laughs> that's another uh episode why people say oh that you know why they want to start a business right but today we're going to explore the benefits and we're going to now that we've we've broken down the myths we've broken down some of the the things that people think and really don't understand we're now going to explore the benefits and visualize your future owning a business and why and how um visualization can and will assist with the birth and the nurturing of this big idea that will give life to other ideas and then we're going to take that information to begin laying the foundation and first steps of your business plan so so far you've had some homework assignments as i mentioned a little bit ago that you should have already been working on and the most pressing one is analyzing and digging inside of yourself you know what makes you tick and what makes you panic freeze sabotage things act a fool (laughs) right um how you operate your personal life will oftentimes be mirrored in your professional life you know your you know how you go about if you pay your household bills late um you kind of lean towards this habit with your company bills and so you kind of get an understanding that what we um we get what we give and we give what we got you know (laughs) so Don't be surprised if your clients and, you know, vendors pay you late or, you know, raw materials that you need for final products are delivered to you late because the cycle is only going to repeat. So make sure that the standards and expectations that you set for others, that you're also bringing the same to the table. I can't stand when people, um, they come, you know, low flowing, you know, mediocrity but then they want excellence from everyone else get out of here with that nonsense get up out of here with that nonsense just come correct i'm raggedy so i'm you know i'm not surprised if i get raggedy i can respect a person who comes at me that way but when a raggedy person expects excellence right no 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 you coming at me with you know 1972 um, pinto or gremlin type um quality quality backfiring and burning up stuff but yet you want the excalibur the bentley the rolls royce experience go sit down 
<laughs> go sit down. So these are the things that uh, we have to make sure that we're stressing. Um, please don't give mediocrity and expect excellence in return. And, you know, making sure that you regularly review your personal SWOT, right? We talked about that. We went through those steps um, last week and making sure that you're updating it. You're sharpening yourself, you know, because your company is a reflection of you. And yes, sometimes you have raggedy moments and your company reflects that as well. And But you need to then own it and take responsibility, be accountable and get the raggedy up out of there. And sometimes that means getting yourself out of there and getting someone else in the role that can be able to assume the responsibilities with the uh, level of care and the character that is required in order for your company to achieve the mission that you've set out for it, right? The whatever strategic plans that you've put in place. Sometimes you can be the barrier. So just being mindful of that and you got to humble yourself and it's very hard Um, Our egos take a pounding, especially because a lot of people that aim to launch businesses um, usually have a a high achiever type of mindset in some regards. Some people just want to see if they can blow something up. (laughs) So with that, um, you've got to be able to humble yourself and understand that it is bigger than you. I know I saw someone had been quoting that they had you know, read the definition of being humble and they saw it as small, but they saw it in a negative way. Instead of understanding this, the smallness is the insignificance that you truly have. And there's people that have a very self-absorbed, overinflated opinion of themselves. And they real, don't realize how insignificant you really are. If you looked at yourself from the vantage point of the, the cosmos, right outside of this planet, and you look down and you'd see how really insignificant you are and if you then take it from that approach man it makes approaching life and everything that is in it so much more enjoyable and rewarding right it's only when we have this self-inflated view of ourselves that we um, struggle so I want to make sure that we're very clear on that so you can keep your ego in check now let's look at some of the benefits of starting a business now we know the missing misconceptions right we talked about that in episode 88 and you can listen to past episodes of this podcast for even more content than I've done over the years that we've you know gone into some greater clarity um, and context in specific topics we've dedicated specific um, episodes to specific topics so you can be able to do that Um, we we dive into people's hearts and minds and we get to that rock in the core um When we find that people say that they want to start a business, after you pull back all the other layers, the heart of it is they want to build something that they love based on their interests and skills and passions. And this is often how our hobbies are turned into those income producing companies, right? We love what we do. We love crocheting or knitting or cycling or or, um, surfing or whatever the case may be and we're like wow I'd love to be able to share this opportunity expose other people um, to this as well I think that other people will will thrive in this so we see that people can turn their hobbies into income producing companies that way a lot of people say they want to help others to improve someone's life and we see this with fitness and skincare companies and other service-based ideas And of course, there's potential for higher income if you put in the work and you connect with the right people who want to invest in you and um, have their needs and their wants satisfied. And there's also a chance to set your work schedule. And no, you don't have to kill yourself with a 90 plus hour grind. Um, I've been there, done that and um, got the T-shirt and the hospital visits and everything everything else. (laughs) The gray hair, you're constantly dying, right? Um, you can be able to create the type of environment that you want to work in, that you will thrive in. And so self-management and focus can revamp your world into a 40 hour or less week. Um, of course, initially, you know, if you're a one person show, you know, or whatever, you know, whatever hours that you post is your hours of operation, your office hours Those are going to be your working hours. And that's when your customers are going to expect to be able to engage with you. So just be mindful of that. What you set in the beginning does not have to be set in stone like it can't be changed. 
but making sure that you're not just flip-flopping like you know like a fish that's flopping out of water where people the inconsistency will make people turn off and turn away um because they can't trust you to be there in the way in which they expect um and so just being mindful that you can be able to say, okay, we normally have these operations and now we're going to reduce down, but, and, and we're in a way you're not having to justify yourself, but, you know, creating a, a backstory, an understanding where you're understanding just the relationship and you're just being respectful of that relationship. So you can modify, but out the door, out the jump, you can say, I'm only running my business on these days between these hours. And, um, I will find people to eventually join my team to also work these hours. Or if we allow these extended hours, then at that time we can offer those extended hours. And maybe it is, you know, um, tailored to those specific team members who, you know, we bring on board. However the case may be, you can create the type of environment. Um, As I've said before on previous episodes in and not just within this series but you know outside of this series I definitely respect companies that will say like we don't work on Sundays or we're closed on Mondays um there's companies that are like you know we're by appointment only uh, there are some that not only restrict the number of days but they opt out of the traditional eight to five or nine to five work hours and so as the owner you can establish when your business is available for engagement you know, when an office says they're closed from 12 to 2 for lunch, they're telling you, dude, we're not conducting business with you between these hours. When I go to, you know, for a prescription at whatever pharmacy and it says we are closed from these hours, I'm not, I mean, I could sit outside their window all I want between 12 and 2. I know they're not going to come to the window and service me. They've already said our employees are having lunch. See you after 2 o'clock. And what is funny is you will see people that pull up around 145, sometimes sooner, and they're posted because when they know when that sign comes up and that window is open, they're going to be pulling their cars up because they're at 201 to start being serviced. But you understand in your condition and you're not going to be out, you know, having a fit because you now know this is what the boundaries are. This is the rules of engagement. This is what we're telling you. This is what we stated and we can't help you with anything else. So, um, I do appreciate when people are very clear about that. So yes, there is a benefit of being a business owner, right? you can also, um, tell your staff that 30 minutes and one hour lunch is madness. It's insanity. It's causing us a lot of heartache and bloat and health issues and mental health issues. I used to despise having to try to haul tail to get back to then clock in or be at my desk or be visible in my office after a 30 minute or one hour break knowing that everybody is taking lunch within the whole 10 mile radius at the same time (laughs) come on now um i just that was something that always irked me and so that's, that is something that I have instilled in the various companies that I've had. And, and, and most importantly with Foreman Associates is being able to have a two hour lunch. Like, come on, we can do this. Something else I have issues with. Um, I used to always work from, eat from my desk, right? Work and then work and eat. And the reality is anyone that sees you at your desk, It don't matter what time they see you. If they see you at your desk, they believe that you're working. If they see you eating and working at your desk, then they're saying, wow, they don't mind the multitasking. So I can now engage them in a work question or task because they have chosen to be at their desk. Let's stop that madness too, okay? Now, if you want to continue it, that's on you. But I'm saying that you as the owner have the power and authority to stop that madness right you can also set and honor the policies about contacting workers after hours and when they are off in the clock or they're on vacation or wherever the case may be that you're making sure that this applies 
to them, but it also applies to salaried employees. There's nothing, I think that is absolute abuse that people have found the loophole in having a salaried employee and the fact that you can then not honor the on off time because you're not paying them hourly. That is bull hockey. Stop it. Stop it. Just stop it. You literally are helping to kill your employees when you do that. There's no light switch. There's no doors. There's no boundaries. There's nothing. You have immersed yourself in their life. Stop. When they leave, they're gone. You know, when they're off clock, when they're on vacation, they are. Just because you, it is your end all all to you, you're totally obsessed with it, doesn't mean everybody else has to be obsessed with it. You shouldn't want everyone else, else obsessed with it. You should want them to take a break and come back with a clear mind and, and energy replenished so they can then come back and look at this relationship with you know a fresh lens and see how they can explore it and what they can now pour into it. So stop that madness too, which is annoying. I mean, it's no different than organizations that intentionally hire a bunch of part-time workers because they don't want to pay benefits. You guys do know you suck, right? You literally suck. And you can think of whatever it is that you suck because you don't want to pay full-time benefits, but yet you're making people do the workload of full-timers within a condensed period of time. You suck. And guess what? Your organization reflects your suckiness. (laughs) Like, I'm just like, let's just keep it real and raw. You're finding loopholes because you don't want to pour into other people. You really don't care about their work-life balance. You really don't care about their health. You don't. You don't care if they get an uplift. You really don't care if they become homeowners. You don't care if they get out of debt. You don't care if their if their house gets, um, you know, foreclosed on or their cars get repossessed. You really don't care because you're not trying to invest in them. You want to extract everything out of them. It's a one sided relationship. I mean, I'm just going to keep it real with you. It's pimping without it being illegally called pimping, like without it being pimping. It is pimping. So stop it. You can stop it. You choose not to if you don't. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I'm just going to leave it with that. You guys know that salaried employees are usually exempt. And they're forced to answer those calls, those texts and emails and IMs whenever and wherever. Because they are not hourly workers. So they're always on the clock. You guys can rebuke that madness. Make it forbidden. What you believe and value shapes the culture and climate of your company. And as a business owner, you have the potential to one day earn the money and time to travel for pleasure. And you also may be traveling for work and attending meetings and conferences and forums and and the such. You want to be able to position your workforce to be able to do the same. But you also want to be able to have travel for pleasure. And you want to be able to be in a position that you can take time away from your company and not be bombarded with the day in and day out of the company. Well, you should want the same for your employees. Now, in parts one and two of this of this series, which are episodes um, 88 and 89, We did some light visualizations to get a feel for what you do and don't want and what you do and don't value. And so I want us to now visualize your ideal business. So we've we've done a visualization of your ideal um, customers, right? So we're going to, I want you to look at the business and, and, and visualize how does it operate? Is it centralized, decentralized, you know, flat? Does it have tons of layers in the chain of command? Is it bureaucratic or more flexible? Um, Are there internal job titles or just external public facing ones? 
Are you less concerned with rank and more concerned with delivering quality results? Um, you know, what are some of the perks and benefits you want to offer? Are they only going to be offered to full timers? Or are you going to also realize the part timers need some perks and benefits too? What will you and your employees see and feel when entering the doors of your company? Or if you're focusing on remote only operations, how will the experience be for you and your team working and engaging year round remotely? I know this is something that I struggled with when I had, you know, um, employees in different states. That was, and this was in, um, you know, the 2000, let's see, when did we, I first started getting someone that was outside of the state was around 2012, I think it was 2012, 2013. And that was difficult. She was in New York and I was in Georgia and trying to do that virtual. And then, you know, um, it, 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 you, you have to, whoa, you have to reimagine, um, the experience from their viewpoint and from also from your viewpoint and how best you can support them and all that goes into it where they feel deeply connected and not like you've placed them on an island not like there are there's a disconnect there so you need to be mindful of that and what ideas do you have to reduce those feelings of isolation that a lot of work, remote workers experience when managers forget about them because the truth is, is they didn't forget about you you've forgotten about them it's out of sight out of mind and so we have to be mindful of that and, you know, I know some of you are anti-remote workers. Like, you know, I don't know. I need to see butts and seats. Okay, fine. So, um, the butts and seats people. How would you handle operations if a crisis forces you to close on-site operations? Like the pandemic forced folks to shut it down. How are you going to address a shut it down environment? Right. If you did not do well during the pandemic, what did you learn from the experience and how can you be able to um, address that? Another question to ask yourself, there, how will leaders lead? You know, what are your beliefs about rewards and punishment and what actions do you think should be rewarded and which actions should be punished? So for, to help you with this, I want you to reflect on your past experiences being rewarded and punished, right? In the workplace, in a relationship. Which ones did you prefer and which ones did you despise that you rolled your eyes at or you just did not prefer, right? And then remember your preferences will lay that law. They're going to lay down the law. Those are going to be the bricks that make up the law for the company. So will your inflexibility. So whatever you prefer is going to lay down the law and the things that you're inflexible about will also play a role in the laws of your company. I, it's important that you seek out some type of counsel from others to, to better assist you with this because you may not understand the legalities that are at play, but also some of the the sociology and the psychology and the anthropology and any other sciences that go into um, what happens when you bring human beings together, <laughs> right? The energy. Um, but I also want you to seek counsel, outside counsel for this because you don't, also, you don't need a bunch of bootlickers and butt kissers around you. I've seen this in organizations and it's infuriating. Cause that's nothing but a recipe for disaster. You got a whole bunch of folks that are looking at the emperor. The emperor don't have clothes on, but nobody want to tell the emperor that he don't have no clothes on. That's just ignorant. And you don't need those kind of people around you. The emperor needs to let those people go. So you need to make sure that you add people to your team who will respectfully question you and also challenge you to do and be better. There is no growth without change. Daggum, I have to say this so many times. People be like, um, I'll grow, but I won't change. A tree grows and the only in the growth requires a change. It's gonna the tree grows, it don't look the same way. It did not start a little little seed, a little sapling, and then turns into a big old oak or whatever the case may be, without changing. It has to change. You gotta change. You do not look the same as you did when you were um, two, two minutes outside of your mother's womb. 
You don't look the same like you did when you were five years old. You start, you change. So it has to change. Your business must constantly change in order for it to fulfill the mission and vision. It cannot stay the same as it did on founding day if where you need it to be in 50 years from now, 100 years from now, if it lives that long. So now you visualize that. And we know last session we talked about, you know, some of our clients, customers, we looked at some of the inner stuff. Now I need you to now let's go deeper in this visualization of your customers and clients. We talked about briefly in last episode, some of the demographics. I wanted you to, you know, visualize the demographics now of what your ideal customers look like, sound like, how they interact, what they have, the disposable income, whatever the case may be. Do the ideal customers that you see in your mind pay on time? Do they pay in full? Are they collaborative? Are they helpful? Do they generate um, referrals for you? Are they loyal, long-term partners in this relationship? Right? I, I briefly touched on that in the last episode. I want you to start digging deeper into that relationship and what they're bringing to this relationship, what they're bringing to the table. Where are these ideal customers or clients located? How far are they from where you live? How far are they from your desired office or store locations? Now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the demographics and the the boxes and the labels like age range and all the other stuff later. But right now let's focus on seeing a relationship with them. Because we make the mistake of just putting these boxes and we check them. And then the thing is, is because everything is so transactional in the way we did it, our intentions that we poured into it, it's hard for us to then commit to the relationship because our heart wasn't in it, right? And so with that, we then don't know how to nurture it because we haven't spent time to really examine what it is and who it is we want to be in a relationship with. And that's the reason why then we're out here, for a lack of better words, we're out here whoring ourselves, chasing money, chasing customers, trying to play this pick me dance because we don't know what it is that we are are investing ourselves in and who we want to be invested in and who we want to invest in this with us. So. Let's focus on seeing a relationship with them. Visualizing your ideal customers or clients. How do they treat your employees? You know, are there more letters and calls of praise about your employees or are there more letters and calls of complaint? Do they see themselves as the sole reason that your company can operate? Or do your ideal customers realize that they only, only reason that their wants and needs are being met by your company is because of the committed and skilled workers that you employ and the suppliers and, and vendors that manufacture or package or deliver whatever elements that enhance the customer experience. Do they understand their role in this relationship? Or are they egocentric enough to believe that it's all about them? And with that, have you created that monster because you say that they are? And a lot of times we do this by saying that they are, by saying things like the customer is always right, which I believe is absolute bull hockey. I've talked about that in different episodes over the past few years as well. Now, how do you you see your ideal customers if you only or mostly see them as transactions like i mentioned earlier right if you only see them as carriers of cash that will be deposited into your bank account then that energy will ooze into your relationship and it will manifest throughout your company and guess what your (laughs) they're gonna figure it out your customers will catch wind of it they'll smell that yeah, it was like cow manure. They're going to smell it. It's like driving down the highway with your windows down and you're, woo! They're going to smell it. And they're going to turn their noses up at that funk and they're going to leave you. 
and they're going to write about you and they're going to talk about you to your competition that they're going to give their money and time to. But before they do that, they're going to become transactional with you. And their loyalty that you want so desperately will become non-existent. So before they leave you, they're going to find ways to abuse you as they feel like you've been abusing them. And then they're going to leave you high and dry. It just happens. So you have to make sure that the rules of engagement and the boundaries that you set with your customers are mutually respectful. As I mentioned, some businesses stand on the belief that you know, customers come first, but there are some businesses that stand on the belief that their employees come first. Because the reality is you can have all the customer demand that you that, that you can imagine, but if you can't supply it with your employees' energy that translates into a, a product or service that is delivered, if there's demand, but if you can't supply it, then what do you really have? You don't have anything. Yeah. So we've looked at the ideal type of business environment. We've looked at the ideal customers. Let's look at your ideal employees. I want you to describe their strengths, their temperaments, skills, personalities. What comes to mind? Who would you like to work with? Who would you like to have a strong working relationship with? How do these ideal employees handle conflict? How do they handle failure? Are they okay with making mistakes? I'm not saying they do it intentionally. They're not, you know, saboteurs, but are they okay with it? Do they break down? Do they, you know, they all of a sudden think they need to resign or feel like they're going to be fired because they made a mistake? Are they used to being punished for mistakes? Like, where is their mind space? Do they like taking risk? To what extent? Is it calculated risk or are they the boldest of risk takers or are they absolutely reckless? Right? Are they the ones that you would never, ever, 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 ever um, give a spending authority to, you know, <laughs> right? They can't sign near a paycheck or uh, not a paycheck, near a, a check to a, a vendor, right? When they, and you may not want them to sign paychecks. <laughs> Imagine that. You may have a person who is, just reckless. Um, we see that where people, a lot of theft, internal theft as well as theft of time. We see some managers will sign off on time giving employees more hours, which means more money that the company has to pay them for hours that the employee actually didn't work. See? So you may not want certain people to have that type of authority. When you think of your ideal employees, what do they bring to your company beside whatever they have summarized on their little fancy resume? How do they work together? How do they support each other? When you're visualizing them in the workplace, when you're visualizing them collaborating virtually, how are they working together and supporting each other? Where will you find these amazing people? Are you finding them online? Are you finding finding them in conferences? Are you, you know, finding them because of referrals from other companies that you have relationships with, with uh, some of your colleagues in the industry? You know, are you meeting them on college campuses through recruitment efforts and in events? Like, how are you finding them? And how will you invest in them? And in what ways will you invest in them? How are you, in, how are you translating and in, in defining investment? Monetarily, or, um, mentally, uh, financially, uh, I already said monetarily. Uh, <laughs> um, right? in, in what ways are you investing in them? So thinking that as well. And how are you going to support them? 
How will you empower them and uplift them and put them in positions where they can help bring about change, that they can visualize the change that needs to come and they can help to activate it and guide it to where it needs to be? Who are you going to be able to uplift based off of what you bring to them, what you entrust in them? What are you willing to give of yourself so that your people can be the best that they can be? So that's what I mean by investing and supporting in them. And in what, how will they support you? When you're thinking of your ideal employees, how will they support you? Because they need to be able to see through your lens. They need to be strong intrapreneurs to then be able to see through the lens of the entrepreneur to see in the ways that they can support your vision so that the organization can fulfill its mission. Can you visualize them? The more I'm speaking, can you visualize these people? And what do you feel right now when you're thinking of them? Is there joy? Is there pride? Is there angst? Is there anxiety? Like what are you feeling as you're visualizing them? Now, a moment ago, I mentioned your vendors and suppliers and other contractors. So let's focus on them. I want you to visualize and describe your ideal working relationship with these people. They're external to your company. Right? They have their own enterprises, their own companies. They're doing their own thing outside of yours and they are providing products and services that your company is benefiting from, is buying um, somehow, right? So have you already created a list of people and companies that you want to work with now in the near future or the distant future? If so, I want you to think of them. If you haven't created that list, I want you to start thinking of some of those companies, some of those individuals. I want you to think of the celebrated wins that you will have thanks to the major parts that they're going to play. Now, I mentioned the independent contractors, right? Let's be also very clear. We did a whole one or more episodes dedicated to how people use the try to use that loophole of contracting out work to independent contractors because you don't want to pay employment taxes and of course the IRS would love to go ahead and make a believer out of you though a whole lot of um unsavory ways in which you're gonna pay for that one and what's so crazy is the penalty is extremely higher than had you just paid employment taxes and various benefits. Um, but, you know, some of us do have independent contractors. Um, how do you nurture those relationships? How do you respect those relationships? Understanding those people have their own external clients. They're a business entity, upon, uh, you know, themselves. And the fact of how they uh, set aside the time to invest in your company so that your company can achieve whatever goals that you're pursuing. You, of course, will need to transfer these visualizations into written outlines to help ground you while also setting you free to fly, if that makes sense. So it's the, it helps ground your ego, helps make you a little more humble so that you understand that you won a, a billions on a planet you got galaxies and universes and blah 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 (laughs) but also taking this information to allow you to fly to allow your brain to register that it can be activated to do what it needs to do you're giving yourself permission to chase that dream because that dream was planted for a reason. It wasn't there to tease and tantalize, right? 
is for there to take off for flight. So let's lay some more foundation for your business plan, which is the living, breathing roadmap you will dream and operate from. And I'm going to walk you through a basic plan and an extensive one as needed by banks and investors. You know, we'll do that in future episodes. You, of course, can search online for templates and tutorials. And there's business plan writers all over. You know, the prices range from 400 to 4000 It depends on how extensive. I will say this. Those of you that want to boohoo and complain about business plan writers that charge hundreds or thousands for a business plan... As you all are taking these time, if you actually are committed and you actually doing the work each week with me for these business plans, if you see how much goes into the business plan research and then taking that and translating that into a document that is written from your vantage point for the benefit of those that are reading it, if you can't see that, and the value that's in it and the time and if you calculated how much your hourly rate is and what you want to make from your business broken down in an hourly rate if you can't see that then you I don't want to say you don't deserve the business plan but I want to say you don't deserve the business plan because if you don't want to pay it then you do it yourself And then I want you to track how many hours it takes you to do it, how many weeks it takes you to do it, to the quality um, and with the depth and the context and the clarity that a lot of these professionals do. Now, I'm not going to say there's not some raggedy business plan writers out there because there are. There are. But there are some quality ones out there too. Some top-notch ones. So just be mindful of that. There are also some organizations like S. BA.gov and Operation Hope.org. So SBA.gov and Operation Hope.org that provide training and resources for free. So you can go to either of these entities and be connected with a professional who can be able to assist you with whatever through whatever programming that they currently have whenever they're offered. Okay, so understand they may not be offered every day year round for you to just jump in and access. They may have scheduled slots for that. So just be aware of that. Um, Very beneficial. I strongly recommend. So you can take what I'm sharing with you now. And then when you're going to either of these entities, you are then well versed and understand. That don't mean that you then want to be the smart aleck. And I already know this because I listen to Natasha. If then then you do then you follow the what Natasha told you to do. So don't do that. Don't go into somebody else's arena and then want to you know you know puff your, your chest out like a rooster. Come in, be humble, learn from them, take the knowledge and the wisdom, apply it so that you can get what needs to be done. So either of these ways can be very beneficial, and then at least you have the one on one. Um, feedback from those professionals that can help guide you as to whether or not your plan is going to be aligned with whatever pursuit that you are, um, you know, putting into action. Now let's lay out the core of your business. We're going to look at the mission, vision, values, and the deal breakers. And so the deal breakers are basically what you won't tolerate, compromise on, or what, you know, no matter what. And don't matter what's trending, you know, whatever the hashtag is on social media, what your grandpa says. <laughs> okay. So your core values. What are your core values? You know, your personal ethics or ideals that guide you when making decisions or solving problems and you're building and nurturing relationships, right? Your values inform how you interact and the focus of your work or the responsibilities that you're going to hold. And with these values... Understanding that um, there's values that may strongly go against your own. You, you have to determine. You have to determine if those values, you can work with them or if they're deal breakers that you need to walk away from. Because someone else's values may not be your own. You may be like, are you out of your rabbit mind? So uh, is that a deal breaker or is that something you're like, okay, I can work around it. 
I'm going to look past that. It's not a big deal. And if you're unsure what your core values are, you can consider, you know, answering these questions. You know, what kind of culture do you want to work in? What environment or settings or resources are necessary for you to do your best work? What qualities do you feel make strong, healthy relationships? What qualities um, do you admire most in your role models? What motivates you? What qualities do you wish to develop in yourself professionally and personally? And I have a list of some core values that might help you better understand, you know, what do you naturally gravitate to as, as well as understand the core values of others. And it could be, you know, your future employees or clients or strategic allies or vendors or business partners. So I'm going to share a few and then the rest will be posted, um, We'll have them posted on uh, foremanllc.com slash podcast. We'll have them posted there for you, but we'll also post them on the blog. So we'll find a way to be able to post the long list. And knowing me, I'll start talking and I'll probably share all of them. So (laughs) I have them all written down Uh, (laughs) because that's just how I can be sometimes, right? Um, (laughs) all right. So looking at my list and I probably will say all these. (laughs) So there's acceptance, accountability, achievement, adaptability, adventure, authenticity, authority, autonomy, balance, boldness, bravery, candor, challenge, clarity, collaboration, compassion, communication, community, contribution, creativity, curiosity, dependability, determination, diversity, empathy, enthusiasm, equality, family, fairness, flexibility, friendship, growth, happiness, hard work, honesty, humility, humor, impact. Yeah, I'm gonna keep going. (laughs) Improvement, ingenuity, innovation, kindness, knowledge, leadership, learning, loyalty, meaningful work, optimism, ownership, participation, patience, peace, persistence, popularity, power, quality, recognition, relationships, reliability, reputation, respect, responsibility, results, security, self-improvement, simplicity, spirituality, stability, success, sustainability, teamwork, tenacity, time management, transparency, trustworthiness, wealth, wisdom, work ethic, work Work-life balance. Yeah. I told you I was going to continue reading them. But I will make sure that we have a PDF of this for you to assist you. So I hope that this has been helpful. Um, As I said, you know, values that strongly go against your own, you have to determine if they are values that you can work with or if they're deal breakers that you need to walk away from. And uh, let's look at your mission. You know, I've shared the definition, the concept, and the purpose of a mission numerous times in previous episodes, but I have to always assume that someone listening to me is listening to me for the very first time. So I want to make sure I recap. Um, Your mission articulates your purpose. It's your why. It's action-oriented. It's not passive, right? It's your empowering message that pushes you with absolute pride and that's the good kind of pride toward achieving whatever dreams that you're pursuing and your mission can change over time especially as the company changes and grows and your values and culture are further enhanced you want it to hopefully um, change Uh, your mission statement can convey and empower uh, and inspire a message that attracts customers and team members and investors and there's countless opinions on what should be stated in your statement and its length. I'm not about to waste time on that merry-go-round. I will say this. Look at your mission statement like a bet against your company. What are you saying that you bet on you and your company achieving under ideal conditions? You know, what's the biggest Goliath dream you want to achieve? Or what are you saying you're going to do that you dare someone to try and stop you from doing? What are you saying that you want to be able to help other people achieve? So for Foreman and Associates, you know, we've had our mission statements changed numerous times since launching in 2010, 20, no, 2011. I'm like, what year? <laughs> we launched. It's, 
<laughs> everything's a blur. Everything's a blur. But, uh, you know, it's it, the focus is on finding, helping you to find and achieve your why. Right? I can help you find your why, but it's not just helping you find your why. You may figure out what your why is, but can I help you achieve it? That is a bet. And I only bet on myself. Right? So I'm betting on Foreman Associates that we can help you find and achieve your why. And that's for individuals and also for companies. Ah! See? Let's look at some mission statements. Now, some of these mission statements may, they may have changed them. You know, I've, uh, you know, I looked and and found them, but some may be changed. So understand if they turned around, they decided to change theirs a month ago. Just understand that this used to be their mission statement. (laughs) So for instance, Tesla's mission statement uh, to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Google's mission statement to organize the world's information and make it universally acceptable and useful. Red Bull's mission statement, giving wings to people and ideas. Asana's mission to help humanity thrive by enabling the world's teams to work together effortlessly. Starbucks announced in March 2023, see, change, that they had a new mission statement, which is, quote, with every cup, with every conversation, with every community, we nurture the limitless possibilities of human connection. So I want you guys to search online for the mission statements for other companies. It could be Disney, Apple, Nordstrom, Amazon, Target, uh, American Express, anyone. Search and see what their mission statements are. See whether or not they are making strategic and tactical and operational plans that are aligning towards achieving those missions. We'll be talking about this type of planning in upcoming episodes as well. So your mission statement can be one sentence or one paragraph. Just make sure, it could be more than one paragraph, just whatever it is, make sure it's something that you and your team can memorize and you can easily recite. Does it make sense to have a long, drawn out mission statement that nobody can can recite? So people are like, well, what's your mission? Um, <laughs> um, well, see what it is. No, it needs to be something that you can recite easily. That you can walk through your company and ask anyone. Jackie, what's our mission statement? Tyrone, what's our mission statement? Mark, what's our mission statement? Susan, what's our mission statement? And they could be able to say it. And say it proudly. All right? Um, And you need to make sure that not only can people be able to say it, it's easier if they could see it so they can then learn how to memorize it. So you have it posted throughout the company in the physical spaces as well as online spaces as a reminder. It can be part of the signature line of your, you know, your corporate emails. Um, However you want to be able to do it so that it helps to drive. It is literally the thing that's going to give you the energy on those days when you're wondering, Why in the world are we doing this? Why are we open during these hours? Why are we servicing these people? Why are we offering these products or these services? Why? Oh my gosh, why, why, why did I ever decide to do this? And the same is true of your employees when they have to push the alarm on the alarm clock to get up to come into your workplace to help you achieve your dreams. Because see, they're trying to achieve their dreams through your dreams. They may not stay the, to the fruition of yours, but understand that they're, ha- they're, they're hitching their wagon because they have dreams too. And it has to align with, they have to be somewhat driven by your mission in order to want to stay with you long term, in order to also see their dreams come true. So making sure that that is a driving force. And just like I had recommended that you do a personal SWAT for yourself and have team members do personal SWATs. It could be very valuable if people have their individual mission statements. Why are you doing this? Why are you really here with this company? Why are you pursuing this degree? Why are, what is your why? What is helping people understand will then help inspire and encourage them, especially during the life storms, during those dark po- moments, during those times where them demons be attacking and telling you that you're not worth it. You're, you know, you're not going to amount to, you know, nothing and you can then be able to say oh yes I am and yes I can and yes I will because 
and whatever that may be can be the inspiration that you need because we all need it. When you are training for any sport, and I ran track um, through from elementary through college, sometimes I'm in the middle of a race and I was a sprinter. So my races are always short, <laughs> you know, depending on the race, 220 something seconds done, right? Um, you know, 100 meters, you know, 12 seconds less done. So it's very fast. But in those races, I am saying to myself, whatever it is that I believe about myself and believe about my ability in this race, it is not about the, it was not about any of the other sprinters next to me. I wasn't running for them. My body wasn't enjoying to theirs. It was about me. So if I had deflating, defeated um, words going in my mind, every time I did, I'd lose a race and sometimes lose measurably because I stepped on the track thinking that about me, speaking it to myself. So we have to be very mindful of um, how our brains are activated, how our minds work and how what we think, what we're thinking, how we articulate and verbalize it and then how we end up manifesting it through the actions that we take to either sabotage and derail our plans or we put things in place and put the people around us to assist us to then be able to give us the uplift and the support that we need in order to achieve what we're pursuing. So just being mindful of that. Um, So those mission statements need to be present, especially, like I said, during moments um, of fear and frustration, distraction. Um, When you keep asking yourself, why are we enduring this? You can say because of our mission. When the question is asked, why are we making these changes? The answer will be because of our mission. Now we've focused on that. Let's focus on our, uh, your company's, your vision statement. Now, this is what I like to tell clients and I like to tell students because you, if you don't know, I'm a college professor. I teach business courses um, and I've done so since 2014. I tell people to visualize a telescope and understand that you're looking far into the distance, right? When you're looking at a telescope, but for your company, you're looking into the future. So you're seeing your company not as it currently is, but where it can be, you know, where you hope it will be doing what you dream it will be doing years from now. And that's based on ideal market conditions and having a strong competitive footing, so on and so forth. So can you also forecast worst case scenarios? Yes, you can. Right. But in a worst case scenario, your vision says, bring it and we'll still rise and thrive. Does that make sense? Yes, there could be a worst case scenario, but what is your vision statement? Your vision is saying, I wish you would, because we still going to do it. So let's look at some corporate vision statements. I've shared some examples of different corporate mission statements. Let's look at some vision statements. The bring it mission statements. Ikea's visions to create a better everyday life for many people. Amazon said our vision is to be earth's most customer centric company to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online instagram said to solve three simple problems mobile photos always come out looking mediocre our awesome looking filters transform your photos into professional looking snapshots sharing on multiple platforms is a pain we help you take a picture once then share it instantly on multiple services Most uploading experiences are clumsy and take forever. We've optimized the experience to be fast and efficient. Now I'm saying, I don't know if this is still their current one. This is what I found. This is what I'm running with because once again, as I say, our vision and mission statements can change, all right? Sony said, our vision is to use our passion for technology, content, and services to deliver. Um, I wrote Kando. I don't know. (laughs) In ways that only Sony can to deliver. <laughs> you know, when you're writing too fast. <laughs> I do too much. Let me see. 
Oh my gosh. Um, it, <laughs> if you cannot laugh at yourself, if you can't laugh at yourself, folks, then something's wrong with you. Now, Sony used to have, um, their statement used to be to be a company that inspires and fulfills your curiosity. And Instagram used to be capture and share the world's moments. So you see how, you know, st- those visions can evolve and change. Um, so how do you write a vision statement is, I'm sure, a question that you have. Um, I was trying to look through my, my notes really quick. Oh my goodness. Sometimes I, you know, whenever I'm writing something down, it depends on what it looks like when I'm I'm writing it. So how you go about writing a vision statement. I want you guys to focus on those core values, right? So we've outlined these different core values. This is one way in which you can do it. And focusing on those values that you want to be the foundation and the layers of your company. So if you think of a great submarine sandwich or an amazing lasagna, um, or whatever. I'm just giving you that visual of layers. And then you're going to look at your mission statement and understanding that a strong company culture is essential to your success. So your vision must align with the mission and vice versa. So I want you to be able to see your company in 10 plus years, 25 plus years. What goals do you have? What do you want to pursue and achieve? And then you write those down. And then you compile this information and then focus on the, whatever the big challenge is and, you know, stability. Um, you could focus on being abstract or inspiring or, you know, you want to be clear and concise and future oriented and, and ensure that there's a time horizon, right? And a time horizon is a fixed point in the future. You want to see that dream come to fruition. So you're attaching a date to it in a, in a sense. You may not verbalize that external to your organization, Right. You, you, but you may, you may be able to visualize that it's something that's in 50 years or whatever the case may be, where, however you see it, you know, you may have a Jetsons, remember the, the cartoon Jetsons, you may have a few, you know, you may be seeing something that's of Jetsons era that was depicted that you want to be able to see manifested and you want to, um, incorporate the physical and the mental, energy that is tangible enough to produce those type of results using technology and any other, you know, um, concepts and things to make it happen. So that is how we can go about doing that. All right. Oh, so now that I have laughed at myself, (laughs) no, but seriously, now that we finished that, let's get deeper into the pool and we're going to glide into the market research uh, so you can further build out your business plan. We're not doing that today, though. Um, in our next episode, we're going to work on market analysis. So I want you to be mentally prepared for that. That is a scary component that a lot of people shy away from. They um, like half commit to and then they, you know, feel affronted when they are um, faced with the marketplace changes and the unknowns because they didn't take the time to delve into it, to really understand what's going on. It's no different than dating, right? This is usually something that men do more so than women, but we do some, some women that put in the work, especially when they're in a competitive mode. Um, cause women can be savages (laughs) just like men. (laughs) Equal opportunity savages. Um, But seriously, when you are looking at the dating pool and you're having to compare yourself to other um, candidates that are trying to pursue and be picked by a person, you are looking at all their strengths and weaknesses. You're looking at the different opportunities that you may have in order to leverage, to position yourself. You may see in the ways in which they could be a threat to you. Uh, we find this a lot and you have to be able to take that same type of mindset and put that into your business to look and see it's not being vindictive like you can do in a romantic setting. That could be so toxic, uh, just toxic. But when you look at it in a healthy approach of saying, I really do need to know, um, in the ways and how I'm doing, having these relationships 
with customers, how I'm having these relationships with employees and vendors and suppliers. And once again, it's not something romantic and, you know, trashy. I just mean that it's all about relationships, right? These connections that we have. So we're going to be looking into market analysis. Your homework until then is to answer the questions I've posed today. You're going to draft your mission and your vision statements. You'll list your values so that you can ultimately craft a value statement. So you don't need to have the value statement written by next week. If you do, great, kudos to you. If not, at least you know what your core values are, what's going to guide you, the things that will be the foundation that will help to express to the world your character and that you people will be holding you to those values, what you state that you are and what your company is. People are gonna be like, let's put a flame to it, let's see. Let's acid test it, let's see. If you've got what it takes, if this really is you, are you just talking to talk? Is this just a PR stunt? Or if this is really you, it's your core. And you're like, this is my core. And you're going to put, you know, uh, bump your chest <laughs> like King Kong. Yes, it is. So with that, <laughs> business gangsters. No, just joking. But seriously, um, that is going to help uh, with uh, lay the foundation for you. And you'll. You're the rest of your homework is you're going to continue working on any previous homework assignments that you have not completed. Please, please don't try to stockpile this information to unpack later. Like don't try to wait till the end of the series and then you're going to try to then jump into the assignments from part one to the end because that's just then showing you're more aligned with interest than you are with commitment and what it will do is it's going to overwhelm you and you'll then put it off and then it's going to be out of sight out of mind until it's needed and then you're going to be running around panicked and when that happens i'm just going to tell you now so that when you eventually get back to this episode later on you can hear me say it when that happens i just want you to find this episode right here and um then fast forward to this section of this conversation so you can hear me say, I told you so. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Get to work. Trust me. You'll thank me later. I'm going to see you back here. Same time, same space next week. Um, I want to thank you guys uh, for um, coming here, sharing this time with me. I wanted to thank you for sharing this podcast, Don't Call It Small Business, with um, other people. Your support is so, so, so appreciated. I want to also make sure we, um, we give proper credit for the show's theme songs. They're by the talented Shane Ivers. And uh, something I tell you on each and every episode, don't call what you're planning, thinking, dreaming, or doing little or small. Go big. Go bold or go nowhere. Have a super awesome day and awesome week. I'll see you here next week. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, there's four things that we ask of you. First, please leave a rating and review. Second, be sure to connect with us on social media. Third, head over to foremanllc.com slash podcast to sign up to our email list and Fourth, check out all the links and resources in the show notes. Thank you for tuning in to the Don't Call It Small Business Podcast, for sharing these episodes with others, and for your continued support. And don't forget what we tell you on every episode. Don't call what you're planning, thinking, dreaming, or doing, little or small. Go big, go bold, or go nowhere. We can't wait to reconnect with you soon. See you next time.